All right, everybody. So today we're going to go over the spinal cord and the spinal nerves. And before we get started with all that, I did want to recap the neuron real quick. I know we covered this earlier in the semester, but I think it's going to help you understand a lot of the parts of the spinal cord if you just keep a lot of these structures in mind as we go through all this. All right, um, so here is my neuron. I know it's not the best drawn neuron in the world, but it will do. Um, so this is probably what you're used to seeing when you see a neuron, but it's also important to understand that not all neurons look like this. All right, sometimes your dendrite can be very far away from your cell body, and you might have even a shorter axon than you do have a dendrite, and there's a whole bunch of different possibilities in the body, but this is just a basic neuron, so just keep that in mind because we're going to see that as we get into the spinal cord. All right, so to start off with, I am going to go over the parts of this neuron. All right, so the first part is this right here, and hopefully you already remember what it's called. So this is a dendrite. And I encourage you to pause the video as we go through this and draw all this stuff out yourself and label it yourself. It's gonna help you remember it a lot better. All right, right after the dendrite, then we're going to have the large part of the cell, which is your cell body. This is where you're gonna find your nucleus and a lot of other organelles. And then connected to that is this long part piece right here called your axon. And then eventually you get to the end of the cell right here. And if you remember what we call this, this is your axon terminal. Remember terminal means the end. All right, so we have an axon terminal. All right, so a lot of neurons also have these structures outside their axons, which I'm drawing here. And if you remember, this is called your myelin sheaths. So these neurons can be myelinated. And I have a label for this in a second, hold on. All right, so you have a myelin sheath. Now, the reason I'm even bringing this up because it's gonna be important to some of the structures that you see in the spinal cord. And um, this myelin, these myelin sheaths actually reflect the color white. So lights can come in and white is going to bounce off. All right, so now that we got the basics of a neuron down, let's go ahead and take a look at the spinal cord. So this is a cross section of the spinal cord. You could find this, you can find this on page 236 of your book. It has it illustrated and that's all the structures you will need to know for the practical is on that page. All right, so I'm just going to go through each one of these structures just so you can see what they are, and then we'll talk about what's going on in the spinal cord. Um, first things first, you do have to understand orientation. So there is a dorsal side and a ventral side to this. So back here is the dorsal side, and there's a couple ways to tell the dorsal side from the ventral side. One is to look for these dorsal root ganglions. All right, so these little bulbs that are on the spinal nerve. And if you don't like that, you could also use the horns that are inside the gray matter here. The dorsal horns are always longer than the ventral horns. All right, so let's go ahead and go through these structures. All right, so the first structure we're gonna cover, or the first structures I should say that we're gonna cover is what divides the spinal cord into left and right parts. So this is your left side over here, this is your right side, because let's assume that we're looking at the superior view right here. And remember, it's always the subjects left and right. So this is the superior, we're looking down at a person, this is gonna be their left side, this is gonna be the right side. Uh, so first we have this dorsal medial sulcus, which is this little indent back here. And we also have a ventral medial fissure, which is this indent on the ventral side. And again, directing you to where they are. So the name of this one's dorsal. This one is ventral. They're both medial. And then one's a sulcus while one's a fissure. And if you read in the brain chapter, the major difference between a fissure and a sulcus is the depth. So fissures are usually deeper than a sulcus would be. All right, the next structure we're going to cover is the dorsal horn. So this is going to be part of the gray matter here. Um, so with this spinal cord, we have gray matter towards the center and white matter towards the outside. And I want you to think back to the brain and how this was in the brain, especially with 
the arbor vitae if you think about how the gray and white matter was oriented there in the brain it was the gray matter that was more superficial while the white matter was more deeper in the spinal cord it's reversed so the gray matter is actually more deep while the white matter is more superficial all right so with the gray matter we have these three horns um, i'm going to talk about this horn in a second because you only find it in certain parts of the body um, but the dorsal horn is right here all right, then we have a ventral horn, which is right here. And then we have a lateral horn. Okay, so with the spinal cord, information comes in in a certain way. All right, so I'm going to cover this again in a second, but just to clarify so it helps you understand these structures. Sensory input is always going to come in through the dorsal side. So sensory neurons are going to come in through the backside. So information is going to come in through the backside. And then we have motor neurons coming out, which means information out is going to leave through the ventral side. So information in through the dorsal, information out through the ventral. All right, so with this sensory in on the dorsal horn, and this is going to be the, a lot of the axon terminals of the sensory neuron. In the ventral horn is where we're going to find a lot of the cell bodies and dendrites of the motor neuron leaving. And then we have this lateral horn, and you really only find the lateral horn in the thoracic and lumbar region, and it's because these are a lot of neurons that control the autonomic nervous system, and autonomic means involuntary. So this, see, this is, these are the neurons that are going to control a lot of the organs in your body, and it makes sense to where you find the lateral horn because where you find most of your organs, you find it in the thoracic or the lumbar region. So that's why you only have these lateral horns in the thoracic and lumbar. You won't see these in the cervical. All right, another structure that we have is the dorsal root ganglion, which is this bulb out here that I mentioned. It's one way to tell the dorsal side from the ventral side. And this is going to house all the sensory neuron cell bodies. And I'm going to draw this out in a second. It might make more sense once I draw it out, but just keep that in mind. This is where the cell bodies are located. All right, we also have ventral, lateral, and dorsal funiculi, uh, funiculus for singular. And that is the white matter that is associated with each one of the horns. So in the funiculus is where you're going to find the myelinated axons of the nerve or the neuron, while in the gray matter is where you're going to find either the axon terminals or the cell body and dendrites. Um, two more structures that I do want to cover here is the gray commissure, which is this crossover of gray matter in the center. And this is really integrating the left and right parts of the body. All right, so you could have information coming through a sensory neuron coming through the backside here, crossing over and going through a motor neuron on the other side. So you could have a stimulus on one side of the body and a response on the other. And then we also have our central canal, which is this hole that goes down the spinal cord. And this central canal is connected to all the ventricles in your brain, and it's one of the pathways of cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. So just remember all the structures that we covered before. I'm going to draw how the, neur the neurons are actually running through the spinal cord, and I think it'll help make sense of all these structures. But just keep in mind the names. Um, so first thing, remember also that it's always sensory comes in through the dorsal side while we have motor leaving through the ventral side. So information coming in through the dorsal side, information leaving through the ventral side. All right, so I'm going to draw a couple of neurons here. So the first one I'm going to draw is a sensory neuron. And hopefully this help make sense of what the sensory neuron is, how the sensory neurons is structured in here. Um, so if you remember this dorsal root ganglion, that's where you're going to find the cell body of the sensory neuron. So this is where the cell bodies are. So I'm just going to draw one neuron, but remember there could be tons here. So here's your cell body. Way out here in the periphery is where you're going to find the dendrite to this neuron and it's going to travel down here towards the cell body and then it's going to travel down an axon towards the spinal cord all right and then the axon terminal is going to be in the gray matter now remember this is not a stereotypical looking neuron all right we have our cell body that is very far away from our dendrite 
And with the sensory neuron, the dendrite could be a lot of different things. Um, it could be a free nerve ending that receives the stimulus directly. It could be a modified dendrite that acts as some sort of sensory structure. Um, it could also be connected to a receptor cell, which is going to pass information off to the dendrite. But this is where information is going to come in. So you have some stimulus that is eventually going to stimulate this dendrite. Information is going to travel down it, past the cell body, down the axon, and into the gray matter here in the dorsal horn. And as you can see, we have nothing but myelinated axon in the funiculus region, and that's why it looks white. That's what the white matter is coming from. And then we don't have any myelination here, giving it a gray appearance. So everything here, we don't have myelination. All right, so I'm going to draw a little bit more complex version of what is going on here. So I'm going to also incorporate an interneuron. So an interneuron could be inside this gray matter that is connecting the sensory to the motor. All right, you might not have any interneurons. You could have a direct connection from sensory to motor, or you might have one interneuron connecting sensory to motor, or you have multiple interneurons connecting sensory to motor. Um, some of these interneurons might even go all the way up to the brain and then come back down and then leave through the motor. Um, just keep that in mind. So here you might have one, none, or multiple interneurons. All right, and then we finally have... our motor output, or I'm sorry, our motor neuron leaving. So here I'm just drawing a cell body and dendrite that's going to synapse with the interneuron here. This information is now going to leave through the motor neuron and travel down into axon and eventually go back out to the peripheries where it's going to interact with some sort of effector and have some response in the body. All right, so just to recap information flow, we got sensory neuron that is connected to receptors in the body that's going to detect some sort of stimulus. So you have information coming in, it's going to pass the cell body, which is housed in the dorsal root ganglion. It's going to enter the spinal cord through the dorsal side, through the dorsal funiculus, and into the dorsal root, where it's going to either synapse with interneurons or directly to the motor neuron. You could have a direct connection here. But eventually information is going to leave through the ventral root past the ventral funiculus, which is just the myelinated part of the axon of the motor neuron. It's gonna travel down the axon here and eventually reach the axon terminal, which is gonna cause some sort of response in the body. So here we're gonna talk about parts of the reflex arc and it's really just a little bit more in detail on how information travels throughout your body as far as coming in through a stimulus and then eventually having some sort of response. Um, there are five steps to the reflex arc. All right, so the first one is that there's going to be some sort of receptor in your body. So the receptor is what accepts a stimulus. So receptor is going to be stimulated. Let's say we have a little receptor in the skin here. This is going to be stimulated and start the action potential. So this receptor is going to pass that information on to the next step of the reflex arc which is your sensory neuron. Your sensory neuron is also known as your afferent. So I'm just gonna draw that real quick. So the receptor passed the information to this sensory neuron that I'm drawing, which is gonna come down here. Remember the cell body is actually in the dorsal root ganglion, and then enter through the dorsal side of the spinal cord, and then go into the gray matter. So here's your axon terminal. Uh, the next step of the reflex arc is the integration center, and the integration center is just what's going on inside the spinal cord here. All right, do we have the sensory neuron synapsing with a motor neuron directly? Do we have an interneuron involved? Do we have multiple interneurons? Is the brain involved? Do we have interneurons going up to the brain and then back down and then to the motor? Um, a lot of possibilities here, but that's, this is the integration center. How is information being passed from the sensory to the motor neuron? All right, so that means the next part is the motor neuron. So let me just, I'm gonna make this a little bit more complex and say there is an interneuron involved with this pathway. All right, but then we have our motor neurons. It's gonna lead through the ventral horn, through the ventral funiculus, through the nerve, 
and then towards some sort of response here. All right, and this brings us to the fifth and final step of the reflex arc, which is an effector. So here, my effector is a muscle. All right, so the effector is what is responding to the stimulus that was created. So here, the effectors are a muscle and, and probably would cause contraction in this situation. All right, so one more time, step by step of the reflex arc. You have a receptor that is stimulated, that passes information down a sensory neuron, also known as the afferent, enters the integration center, where information is passed from sensory to motor, and then there's multiple ways that could happen. Then the information is going to travel out the spinal cord through the motor neuron, also known as the efferent. And then that eventually is going to reach an effector where you have a response. All right, so there's two major types of reflex arcs as far as the integration center goes is monosynaptic and polysynaptic. And I'm going to draw examples of each one of these. But this is really not that complicated, especially if you break down these words. All right, what does mono mean? Well, it means one, right? What do you think synaptic is referring to? Well, it's referring to how many synapses are there. So in a monosynaptic, we only have one synapse. All right, one synapse. Here we have polysynaptic. Poly means many, again, synapse. So we have multiple synapses here. So I'm gonna draw examples of each one of these. And this is referring to what's going on inside the integration center. All right, so I'm just gonna draw a quick monosynaptic response. So let's say we have our receptor in the skin again, that's gonna pass information off to the sensory neuron. Enter into the dorsal root ganglion where we have our cell body and then out through the axon into the dorsal horn where our axon terminal stops. And this axon terminal in a monosynaptic response is going to synapse directly with the dendrite of a motor neuron. And the motor neuron is going to leave through the ventral horn, through the ventral paniculus, out the spinal nerve again, and then towards your effector. All right, so again, monosynaptic. Where does monosynaptic come from? Let's talk about the integration center. How many syn synapses do we have in this integration center? Well, since it's a direct connection of the sensory to motor, we only have one synapse right there, monosynaptic. All right, then let's do a polysynaptic. So again, I have our little receptor, sensory neuron leaving. All right, entering the spinal cord, we have our axon terminal. Well, and the polysynaptic infers that there is an interneuron, at least one could be many. The brain could be involved as well in a polysynaptic response. Then we have our interneuron, then we have our motor leaving. And then eventually going to our effector. Okay, polysynaptic, many synapses, meaning more than one. All right, so let's look at our integration center here. How many synapses did we make? Well, we made one and two. So that definitely falls into the polysynaptic category. And it doesn't have to be just one. If you have tons of interneurons, you have tons of different synapses that have to be made as well. If the brain is involved, it's probably polysynaptic. So if you want examples of monosynaptic and polysynaptic, your book gives pretty good examples of this. Um, for the monosynaptic, it talks about the patellar reflex. If you've ever been to the doctor and had your knee whacked, that's what they're testing. And that is a monosynaptic response. So you have little muscle spindles that are inside your quadriceps and it detects changes in pressure. So when they feel that kind of blunt whack from the hammer that the doctors use, it sends a signal down to sensory neuron and then goes directly to a motor neuron back to your quadriceps to cause them to tighten up and for your leg to kick. All right, so that is an example of a monosynaptic. There is no interneurons involved there. And you can see how quick that response is. Versus a polysynaptic, and again, the example your book uses is the flexor reflex. So a flexor reflex is when you, let's say, injure your hand. Well, the injury is the stimulus. It's gonna cause a receptor to pass information down a sensory neuron. And with the flexor reflex, it's a polysynaptic response, and there's multiple in 
interneurons involved, so multiple synapses, so it passes all the different interneurons and eventually leaves through the motor and goes to your biceps brachii, and that will then flex and causing your arm to pull back or retract from whatever the pain or whatever is inflicting the pain. All right, so that's an example of a polysynaptic if you need one. All right, so that's all I wanted to cover for right now. Hopefully this is enough for you to get started with the reflex chapter.